We've been hearing all sorts of things about Unity Dots and ECS, but don't really know what it all means. If that's the case, then stay tuned because in today's video, I'm gonna be going over what Dots and ECS are and how they work on a high level. By the way, if you do wanna to jump to a specific section of the video, check the description. I've included some time codes to these specific topics that I'll be going over. Also, I've created a quick reference guide, which you can download in the link down in the description below. So if after watching this video, you wanna say like, look up something like, like what does the burst compiler do? What can I use that with again? The quick reference guide is just a really handy way that you can quickly look some easy things up like that. So again, be sure to download that from the link in the description below. And if you do find this video helpful, I'd really appreciate if you hit that like button and also feel free to subscribe to the channel for lots more videos on Unity Dots and ECS. Of course, if you have any questions for me or suggestions for future videos, Feel free to leave those down in the comment section below. All right, so let's get right into it. So first of all, what is DOTS? So DOTS stands for the Data Oriented Technology Stack. And it basically is gonna encapsulate everything that I'm gonna be talking about today. So DOTS is kind of like the overall container for different ways to structure our code and how we build our games to really get performance. And that's what DOTS is all about. It's, it's performance by default. So not only with DOTS can we get really crazy performance at the high end, but we can also bring more complex things to lower power devices like web browsers, Nintendo Switch, or mobile phones. So again, DOTS is kind of like the overall big picture. It's the whole technology stack, and that's what we're gonna be talking into today. You know, the little components that go into this whole technology stack. So the first one of those that I'm gonna be going over is ECS. Now ECS is a very common one that you're gonna be hearing about, and the term is almost used kind of interchangeably with DOTS, but ECS, what it stands for is the Entity Component System. Now Entity Component System is actually three different things. So you have entities, components, and systems. And so these are all broken up to really get high performance out of your game. So traditionally when you create games with Unity, we use object-oriented programming. And so that's basically where we have, you know, things called game objects. And on those game objects, we have components, which have scripts that contain data as well as logic to change that data. So of course, a typical one would be a player, and then we'd have maybe some health data associated with that and some logic that can kind of control how our player moves throughout our game world. Now with ECS, it's a completely different method of thinking. So we actually separate all these things out. So again, we're separating them out into entities, components, and systems. So entities are really nothing. They're just kind of like an identifier for something within our game world. They don't contain any data and they don't have any you know, logic associated with them or anything like that. They're basically just a unique identifier which identifies which pieces of data are all associated with each other. Now components contain the actual data within our game. So components are simply structs of data and they only contain variables. They don't have any functions or any logic or anything like that. They basically just contain variables. So again, kind of going back to our um, main player example, the variables such as like health and movement speed will be associated in some of these data components. And you'll also see components for common things such as renderers, physics shapes, and physics bodies, things of that nature. And where we start to see the real benefit for using ECS is how these components are actually organized in memory. So like components are basically all grouped within the same kind of areas in memory, so the computer can kind of access these components really quickly as opposed to searching through all these different random areas in memory. So then lastly, we have systems. And systems are where we store the logic that's going to modify our component data. So systems operate on a collection of entities with a specific set of components. So for example, we could have a system that tells all the enemies within our game to move. And so the way we do that is basically we just have like a for each loop that basically says for each entity that has an enemy controller component associated with that, we're gonna be moving it this frame. And again, with ECS, this makes it really easy for our computer to just go directly to that spot in memory with all the enemy components, and then it just goes and updates all the enemy components just right in a line like that. So again, this allows us to get really high performance out of our game, and we can have many more enemies on the screen than we ever could before using ECS. Now, one thing that works hand in hand with Unity ECS is the C-sharp job system. And the C-sharp job system is essentially how we can start to do multi-threaded code within Unity. And writing multi-threaded code allows us to take advantage of these, you know, fantastic multi-core processor machines which we have today. 
Of course, you'll see many computers with, you know, four cores is pretty common, um, but you're starting to see more eight cores. And of course, you get like the Threadripper with 64 cores and up to 128 threads. And so previously in Unity, pretty much everything was all created on the main thread and it all just runs on a single thread. And really there were only like background Unity processes running on some of these other threads. So now using the C-sharp job system, we can create basically what are called worker threads and kind of designate some uh, other tasks to these worker threads. So we can kind of designate if we want something to run on the main thread or if we want to schedule it to run on a worker thread. And this is really nice because Unity kind of handles all the particulars for you. So you can kind of just like write this code and deploy it to any platform. Doesn't matter if it's running on, you know, just a simple quad core PC or again, running on a 64 core thread ripper. So there are some performance considerations that you have to keep in mind when you start to do some of the uh, C sharp job scheduling and everything like that. But for the most part, Unity handles all the dirty work for you and you basically just need to say, you know, hey, is this something that I'm gonna be running on the main thread? Or if I'm gonna be doing like a bunch of operations, can I separate this out onto a bunch of worker threads? So again, this helps us get really high performance out of our game. Now, the next thing that I wanna talk about is the Burst Compiler. And this is something that's primarily designed to work hand in hand with the C-sharp job system. Essentially, it optimizes your code for the platform you're building for. Now, there's a lot of kind of crazy magic stuff going on behind the scenes, and you as a developer don't need to really worry about a lot of what's going on. Basically, you just say, you know, hey, do I want to use Burst or not use Burst for this? Actually, it's even a little bit simpler than that. With ECS, you use Burst by default, and if you ever run into any issues where there's an incompatibility with the Burst compiler, you basically just say, you know, do this method without Burst, and then you can just run it without the Burst compiler. In general, you can only use the Burst compiler with things that are value types, and you can't use it with things that are reference types. So things that are value types are, you know, like integers, booleans, you know, pretty basic, simple things like that. Whereas things like strings and full class structures, those are reference types. So you can't be using those with the Burst compiler. But as always, just be sure to check the documentation when you are using the Burst compiler. Um, if there's something that's incompatible with the Burst compiler, you're just gonna get an error right away and you just say without Burst and that's basically all you need to worry about for now. Now, the next part of the data-oriented technology stack that I'm very excited about is the new physics systems that are available to Unity. So we have two physics systems. There are Unity Physics and Havoc Physics. So Unity Physics is kind of the simpler version. It's fast and lightweight, and it's really ideal to use for just easy implementation, as well as multiplayer games where you don't need like very specific physics calculations, um, but you do want fa fast back and forth translation between um, you know, yourself and the server and whoever else is playing that multiplayer game with you. It's also good for mobile games and just anywhere you need high, just quick, efficient physics systems. And also really exciting is that we can now use Havoc physics within Unity. And it's pretty cool because Unity's partnered with Havoc so we can natively use the Havoc physics engine through Unity. Now the Havoc physics engine has been in development for over 20 years now. I'm sure you've probably seen this logo on video game boxes or um, just splash screens if you've been paying attention. And it's good for when you need precise and robust physics calculations for high-end games where you have a lot of physics interactions happening. And the really cool thing about this is you can use one physics system or the other physics system or some kind of combination of both. It's really up to you as the developer. Another exciting thing coming to the data-oriented technology stack is networking for multiplayer. So this is where you use something called netcode, and this is something that I haven't really messed around with too much, but I do plan on um, diving a lot deeper into. But basically it offers client-side prediction, authoritative server, as well as interpolation. So basically what that means is the server kind of has like the, the final word of where something is in your game or maybe if a shot fired or didn't. And the client side prediction basically just takes all the information that it knows about the game and kind of where different players were moving and things like that and kind of predicts where they will be the next time that it receives an update from the server. Now if there ever is some kind of discrepancy between the server side and the client side, then it uses interpolation to kind of like finalize that calculation of where the person should be and it just kind of makes everything look smooth. Now the last thing that I'm going to be talking about about the data oriented technology stack is something that I'm really excited for and that is Project Tiny. 
Now Project Tiny allows you to use, you know, all the things that we've been talking about and make a game with really small file sizes. So this makes it really easy for you to get your game in the hands of players because of the such small file size, you know, it can be loaded very quickly onto mobile phones and web browsers even if you have a really poor internet connection. And one pretty cool feature of Android phones, you may have seen this before, something called Google Play Instant. And it's basically where you can kind of like load up a game on the Google Play Store and you just click play now. And then it downloads a very small section of the game onto your phone. And so you can, you know, play an actual demo of the phone literally within seconds. So this really just lowers the barrier of entry of getting people to try your game. So then you'll end up with a larger potential player base. So anyways, those are kind of some of the main things that are coming to the data oriented technology stack. And I tried to give you kind of a higher, higher level overview of how these things work. There are a few other things coming to the data oriented technology stack soon, such as improving improvements to audio and animation, uh, but I didn't want to get into those too much because those are kind of outside my area of expertise. Once again, be sure to download the quick reference guide that I have that goes with this video that just kind of goes over all the things that I talked about and again provides a quick, quick reference for you to just look something up quickly um, in case you forget exactly how it works. So be sure to download that using the link in the description below. Of course, if you did enjoy this video, I'd really appreciate it if you hit the like button. Also feel free to subscribe to the channel for lots more videos on Unity Data Oriented Technology Stack, Entity Component System, C Sharp Job System, Burst Compiler, all that good stuff. Of course, if you do have any questions for me or suggestions for future videos, feel free to leave those down in the comment section below. But I hope you all have a fantastic rest of your day, and I'll see you in the next one.